Welcome to Cyberables, everyone. Elon Musk and Tesla are making some big moves now. First, this weekend, Elon is apparently meeting with the CEOs at Samsung and Hyundai, talking about how the companies might work together. Second, Uber and BYD announced their own partnership. And third, Elon just said that we can expect a doubling of average miles driven before an intervention is required by this month, August. So we've got the bulls here with us today. I'm Herbert Ong. I'm Alexandra Mertz. I'm Jeff Lutz. I'm Xander Sky, the options bull. And I'm Cern Basher, the bulk bull. All right, welcome everybody. So uh, we've got a big agenda today, lots to cover, so many things happening. But of course, we all got together, except Cern wasn't there this weekend. We were at the X Takeover. Tesla owner Silicon Valley had this fantastic event in California. At least 1,500 people, I think, were there. Even Elon Musk uh, dialed in, and so did Franz von Hallhausen, the chief designer. And that was a lot of fun. So we were able to present. We got there and we actually had a panel. And this was a fantastic photo. Gali being our, our special guest that day. What do you guys think? I think it's good that you show this picture because it is actually <laughs> proof of what happened here. So, so let me just put make this straight. Um, the way Cyberbulls is organized, we have a CEO. Okay. He's CEO, he's tech, he's everything. It's Herbert, of course. Yes, I am And CEO. Herbert sent the corporate memo and organized these beautiful t-shirts. Well, first round of t-shirts was rough and not to our liking. So he organized a second round of t-shirts. So we got our t-shirts. We all agreed to wear it. And then surprise, surprise, the CEO showed up in a dress shirt in a dress shirt to be Color different, good. right? <laughs> then the second thing he did, you see it here, he offered me a beautiful crown. I was all, you know, glad to be recognized. The whole thing was much too small. I mean, I can put it on again. You'll see it. It holds nothing. So on these beautiful pictures, I'm with a Moroccan lampshade now. So you will see me with a Moroccan lampshade. <laughs> but we did a fabulous job. I think actually Herbert asked great questions. He made us lay out where we think Tesla is going to be in a couple of next months. So Xander addressed that in 2025. Uh, also great speech by, by Jeff. Then 2026, I discussed a couple of, of milestones in the market, I think, in 2026. And then Gali had the vision um, above that time frame. So it was, it was really great. We had time to answer some questions that came up. Absolutely enjoyed it. <laughs> Jeff, go outside. Your T-shirt's in. Make sure you get it out of the mail. Make sure it's the material you want. We have to bring it. We have to wear it at the event. Remember that? It was a last, last second decision on my side, guys. Come on. I had all oh, sorts wait, wait, of... Wait, wait. Explain to us. Explain to us. Why would you last minute not put on that beautiful T-shirt that the peasants were wearing and you <laughs> felt you had to put on a dress shirt. Okay, I, no, came, no, wait, in wait, wait. I came in shorts, right? I came in shorts. And, and then so I said, okay, well, I'm going to wear my shorts and all that. Then I go, oh, gosh, I better just wear my pants. And now I go, I can't why wear a t-shirt on this why, pants. Why better? <laughs> there you go. Sure. Look, I'm wearing it today, right? This is it right here. That's the wrong <laughs> one, but okay. Is it? Is it? it? It's not it, but it, it's okay. No. Mine's a little different than you guys. Yeah. I guess. Oh, you had okay. from the start a bit of a different one? Yes. Oh my gosh. Jeff, Jeff, this is just going nowhere. I mean, our negotiations. Yeah. We should, we we should move on. Us. I think people yeah. want to hear uh, what we're actually doing uh, other than Herbert's follies. <laughs> okay, absolutely. So that was fun. I mean, certainly we missed you there. That was uh, just a blast and it was very well done. The company and the product. I don't look at the quarterly stock movement. A very realistic bull, questioning certain decisions. The rational bull. We enjoy listening to bears. We're looking for the red flags. You're supposed to react. The longer term opportunity for Tesla is like no other company that I've ever seen. Today, yeah, we're going to cover some big news. Tesla. Uh, you know, is about to meet. Elon is about to meet with the CEOs at Samsung and Hyundai. So this is uh, what came out was, according to an article, this report, Elon Musk is going to meet Samsung CEO Lee Jae-yong and Hyundai CEO Chung yu Sun, both Koreans from South Korea and Paris in early August, which actually is this weekend. So these are uh, the CEOs meeting with Elon in the article. This is, this is uh, Hyundai's car with their LiDAR, the Ionic 6, I think it is. It's crazy how many, um, I think they said they have 30 sensors 
I looked at their website. According to the article, they're going to dine in Paris this weekend. They'll also discuss the development of next gen technologies and explore ways to cooperate. And uh, it was reportedly made at the suggestion of the chairman, Lee Jae Young. What do you guys think about what's going to happen there, Jeff? I actually saw that you had a uh, post here and you said, hopefully true. I've heard there's a great relationship here. Samsung is a leading component supplier in the world, fab, fab capacity for the, for, the, for the silicone, HB memory, cameras, displays, batteries, probably not currently in other components. Meanwhile, Hyundai is a growing EV footprint, FSD license. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, uh, this is this is great. These are two uh, very powerful CEOs in the world. Uh, South Korea is a hotbed of tech innovation. Samsung's one of the best companies in the world as it relates to building components and actually building uh, end devices. Uh, the the big thing I think that that's on the menu, and I didn't put it in my tweet, I did actually throw it in my subscriber recently. Uh, TSMC, who's the one of the primary fabs for a lot of the AI chips and, and systems that are shipping, they're, they're they're raising prices. They're out there. They've been raising prices for the last actually I think one or two quarters, and uh, it's it's going to be a problem. Uh, you know they've got to do these fab buildouts in the U.S. and and they've got to add further capacity. So I think Elon getting closer with the Samsung CEO, who is also their you know, tremendous uh, fab capacity capability, uh, and what they're you know what they're expanding on in Austin as well. I think that's really important. That's an important hedge, uh, and quite frankly, primary, you know, dual sourcing that fab capacity, I think is probably one of the most important things. And I think Samsung is also a primary camera supplier to Tesla for all the cameras you see on, on your vehicle. So uh, a lot to talk about there. And of course, with the Hyundai CEO, Hyundai's got a growing EV footprint. They're, they're probably going to be, you know, number two in the U.S. here soon. They make a good product. They're bringing costs down. They're expanding their product line. So, what they would be a great potential partner for an FSD license. So, I think I think it could be a real. This could set up to be a really important conversation. Uh, knowing the South Koreans and knowing this is in Paris, uh, I think it'll be a, a nice, it'll be a nice dinner and lots of booze flowing. <laughs> like our dinner that we had, lots of booze flowing. Uh, what do you think, mm -hmm. Alexandra? I think it's yeah. actually super interesting that it's in Paris because, you know, the, the Olympic Games are still ongoing. It's highly complicated to get a hotel room. It's even more complicated to get a, a Saturday evening restaurant uh, reservation. So I don't know why they choose Paris, but maybe they all have, you know, other reasons to be in that city. But I thought that was very interesting. And it's also interesting that actually filtered through i mean again we have no confirmation yet from elon whether it's it's taking place but if it is taking place um it, it was not the easiest dinner to organize and so it must be really important you know this this uh koreans are get, gathering together so clearly this is something we've we've seen lots of south korean companies do right they conglomerates they like to support and partner with each other why why the partnership between a chip manufacturer and hyundai why doesn't just hyundai say hey elon let's have lunch why does he include the chip manufacturer well, from my perspective, the futures, the future of all three of these companies are are tied pretty closely. Uh, Hyundai uh, as a as an automaker. I think the other interesting part with this too is on the humanoid bot side. Uh, Hyundai owns Boston Dynamics, um, mm. so I'm curious as to whether there'll be any discussion about humanoid bots. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for the conversation. But Samsung certainly as a major chip provider and also as potentially a future battery provider to, to Tesla. So they're all very intertwined in that in that regard. Okay. And then uh, Xander, what's going to happen to the stock? Uh, nothing, right? This is just a dinner. But what if they made an Absolute. announcement? Uh, depends on the announcement. So uh, you can see that uh, the stock reacts to the wind. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't know, I don't know which way it's going to go up or down, but, uh, uh, you know, I think that this, this point that CERN just made is something I didn't contemplate. So, uh, that's, that's great information. I appreciate that, CERN. Yeah. I didn't think of that either, CERN. That was fantastic. So the, the other thing that's related that happened is BYD announced that they're going to partner with Uber. So they're going to start using BYD cars. Uh, Uber 
they're going to have their drivers and are going to motivate them to buy BYD cars in Europe and Latin America, and then in the future develop autonomous capable vehicles. They say that there's going to be 100,000 electric BYD cars, but it's a multi-year strategic partnership, so they don't really say exactly who's buying. And Uber's not buying it. They're just giving financing and kind of good uh, leasing deals, but they then specify what that will be, and then they go, they'll develop autonomous capable vehicles together. And this is what the BYD cars look like, of course. They did not say which BYD vehicles will be offered. And then Jeff, you said something like this. Last year, BYD said autonomy is impossible, and it's called out in the article that Dara, the CEO, shared. Also, how efficient is this arrangement between Uber, which is based in Silicon Valley, BYD in China, and Aurora, uh, which is, I guess, their um, tech company in Pittsburgh. And this is the clip out that you said a BYD spokesperson had said in April that that last year that fully autonomous driving is basically impossible. Tech would not would be better applied to manufacturing. So BYD did not seem like that they're working autonomy at all. Elon replied to you and he said BYD needs to change course fast or they're in trouble. There's many ways to interpret that. How did you interpret that, Jeff? Uh, well, now BYD, there's rumors that they have 5,000 people working on autonomy. So it's all over the place. Uh, when you restructure like that pretty abruptly, which they just did, I think this summer, um, it tells you that, you know, there's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of change. Um, you know, Tesla has a few hundred people, at least on the software side, working on autonomy, not in including the, the Silicon team. So usually these smaller teams with better engineering um, get more done. And they have, you know, they have greater accountability, less dolution. So BYD has been all over the place. I mean, they're on the record again last year saying they don't think autonomy is happening. Uh, and they just, they'd much rather spend their funds elsewhere. And then now there's apparently there's a rumor that they've now created a gigantic team and are working on it. It's all over the place. It's hard to know it's true. Uber um, has an investment, I think in Aurora and they've been partnering with them. So in these situations, I've, I've talked about this before. Uh, if you if you have a company with the right leadership and the capability to basically vertically integrate this stack, and the stack going from the silicon layer all the way you know to the to the consumer experience and what they you know and what they will see, I think that is the solution that will get to market fastest. It will have the best quality solution, best performance and it will have the most scale. When you have these partnerships that involve three, four companies, first off, making products like this invariably, they involve partnerships. But on these important things where you're innovating on things that just don't exist, the more, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty and the more fingers you have in, in that pie, the, the, I think the more uncertain the outcome will be. And, uh, and you can see it, I mean, all these, um, all of these non-vertically integrated efforts related to autonomy are not uh, really doing, you know, not really doing well. And you've got to look at it in all the vectors. You know, how does it perform? Uh, can it scale from a volume perspective and can it scale economically? So uh, I think I think Elon's point, you know, just to wrap up is if you don't have a serious internal solution and effort where you've got line of sight, you know, if you if you start working with Tesla now, you can be up and in production probably within a couple of years. And I think that's the point, you know, make that decision. Tesla and BYD already have existing partnerships on the component side. They're, you know, they don't hate each other as, as companies they are competing, but they don't hate each other. But I think Elon's kind of making the point of like, you know, it, it, it either, you either need a robust internal solution or you should be partnering with us. Okay. Who here thought that BYD was going to be a good first partner for Tesla, especially after Elon said this needs to be at about a million. And then who here now thinks after seeing this that maybe that's not the case? Yeah, I did. I, I thought BYD could be the first one in a massive scale because just nobody else builds as many battery electric vehicles. Um, so it um, it was the first candidate for it. And, and I hear Elon when he says he's not going to do an agreement with somebody who uh, builds 10,000 cars because, you know, that's just not going to make sufficient difference. So it's uh, I feel it's still all very moving. I don't have a, an opinion whether BYD can continue being a partner or whether they are now really only doing it on the, their own. Um, 
I don't have enough information yet to really be clear about that. I think if we uh, just one quick comment, if we if we were able if we were able to see inside of the ramp plans, I think for BMW, Mercedes, and probably Hyundai in two or three years. So by the time they get to two or three years, they could be up at those thresholds in terms of EV output. Um, so, you know, those could be a couple of the players that are being that that they're having conversations with. Um, but I think it's I think it's going to I think those conversations are going to increase, and I think the agreements will will be in volume. Uh, so, but yeah, just you have to you have to think about ex, extrapolating out a couple of years and where it'll be from a volume perspective, not only today. The thing that I took from Elon's comment was if they were talking to BYD, I would be kind of shocked that he would phrase his comment the way he did. That's what I thought so too. Yeah, what do you mean? Well, it's just if you are talking to them about licensing FSD and then to write a post that says, you know, if they don't change your ways, you're in trouble. It it's, seems to me that they're probably not at the table talking about licensing F, FSD. Or DHS. Maybe. No. You know, you know, well, I mean, no. that just, just, you know, that kind of, I, I agree with CERN, but in that, but that conversation could start next week. Yeah. For all we know. Um, <laughs> so. No. I like okay. Herbert. Herbert's it's, taking it's, a it's, screenshot. Okay. It, right. It's a statement that has some pressure associated with it coming from Elon. It carries some weight. Yeah. So, that's the point. I mean, that's the point. It could, okay. it could start soon. So who knows? I, I think, the fact Tesla is having these conversations, I think is good. Uh, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be BYD. Uh, but I, I think you're going to see some pretty strong volume coming out of those three players I mentioned earlier. Okay. You know, the way I saw this was basically, okay. It just kind of makes sense, right? Uber, uh, Hey, <laughs> and they're trying to find, partners to sell electric vehicles to their drivers. They already partner with Tesla. Tesla already, they already have this deal with Tesla drivers in the US. If you're an Uber driver in the US, you want to have a Tesla, you can get $3,000 off up to that based on your driver experience. And, you know, Uber will try to give you good financing terms. So this makes sense for Uber to say, hey, yeah, you're going to sell me. And, and it actually makes sense for BYD to partner with them because they have the low cost car and that's going to even make their economics better. BYD, why not? <laughs> You're going to market me. I'm going to sell it to your drivers. That's all this is, a simple partnership agreement. And then this whole conversation about autonomous driving in the future, neither party have any movement there. That's nothing. It's a nothing burger. That's nothing there. I, I agree with you. Can I just add to what um, what Jeff just said? So um, as of calendar year 2023, Volkswagen sold 758,000 battery electric vehicles, GM 641, right? So it's, uh, I mean, and then BMW, because you spoke about BMW, let me get that number, right? 378. So 378 getting to a million, I think I'm, I'm doubtful. Mercedes 244,000 getting to a million, that would be four times. And, and Mercedes pretends they have a, level three, four solution, right? So I'm, and and then I, I may agree, it could be Hyundai, Hyundai 418,000 last year. So maybe you're right on, on Hyundai, but the Germans, I just, I don't see it. I don't see it growing as quickly in two, three years and I don't see them ready for it yet, but I could be wrong. What do you think of the timing of this announcement? Why, why was it one week before the original Robo Taxi event? Anything connected? Oh. Oh yeah, I, I think that was planned. I mean, they all knew it was eight eight. It it sounds very suspicious. They just came out just like that, out of the hat. I like the announcement because it, it does accelerate the mission. Right, the more EVs we have on the road, particularly ones that are being utilized highly, is good, whether they're Teslas or not. That's fantastic. Yeah. FSD yeah. takes us to the next step beyond that. So this is a good first step. Replace everything with EVs. That's great. Okay. So let, uh, so let's tie it all together, right? So we heard Elon say at the earnings call, he goes, we're, we are in discussions with two, or he said multiple, right? Multiple large OEMs. And then 
Then we have this news about Hyundai meeting. You think that's they were part of that or they're new? Because you're saying, oh, BYD could be coming later. I don't think so based on that. That, that statement, the way Elon did it, sounds to me like that was a little bit more of this. Or they, or they were talking and it broke down. I mean, it could be a number right, of right. things. Yeah, it's a handful of them. We'll see. Do you think you think Hyundai was part of that multiple or do you think that uh, they might be new? I don't know. Yeah, okay. Usually, usually when you get to the point of a meeting with the actual principals, so Elon, these are the, fi- these are the CEOs of these companies. Yeah. Usually something's pretty far along. They don't just meet for the first time and, and broach a topic. Usually uh, there's been something happening in the background and and this is the meeting to like, you know, yeah. th- if, this, if this meeting is set up the right way, the Tesla supply chain team set up Elon with a set of ass for Samsung. And the Tesla supply chain <laughs> team worked with the Samsung team in advance so they yes. can brief their CEO and everybody's aligned. Same, you know, on the FSD side, you know, there could have been some the conversations. Usually these when these when these um when these meetings happen, it's usually like things are most of the way there, but there's some big decisions or there's some big negotiating points they just need to push over one side or the other. Thank you. You see, you did know. I knew that you knew. So I asked you the question, right? Come on, guys, look at that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just speculating. I don't know no, anything. But- None of us know, but that answer was exactly what I uh, was thinking you were going to say. So <laughs> I know before you know. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we talked about Tesla, Samsung, Hyundai. We talked about you, you, Uber and BYD. FSD, Elon says, could be two times better. This month in August, we have a clear path to doubling average miles between interventions in August. Uh, CERN, you put together this table. It's gorgeous. Tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, I just wanted to help people sort of understand what we're talking about when we talk about disengagements and this March of Nines. So I'll just kind of walk through it real quick. So at the top row, if there's one disengagement for every 10 miles, and if the average driver drives 14,000 miles a year, and let's just say it's evenly 365 days of the year, then you're going to have about four disengagements per day. Okay, and 1,400 yeah. per year. If you go to one disengagement per 100 miles, now you're down to a disengagement every two and a half days, right, or 0.4 per day, right? And it's 140 per year. Now, if you get disengagements down to one per 1,000, you're really no disengagements on any given day, but you are at about once a month, mm. okay, just over once a month. Um, on an annual basis, and you're at 99.9% in terms of reliability percentage. Now you get disengagements down to one per 10,000. Now you're at um, once a year, Mm -hmm. it's a little over once a year, right? And if you consider a human lifetime, 90 years, you're like 126 in a lifetime, 99.99%. Drive it further down, one per 100,000 miles, right? Now you're almost at nothing per year, none per year. Wow. And it's 12 in a lifetime. Yes. Okay. One per million. Now you're at none per year. And once in a lifetime, you might have a disengagement. Mm. Then you get down to 10, once in 10 million. It's virtually none for, for a year or a lifetime. And you're at 99 and five nines reliability. So I just wanted to sort of provide this as sort of the level set in terms of this is where Tesla has to head. I don't think they have to be at the bottom of this table to start a robo taxi network, but clearly the more reliable that they can become over time, the better. There'll be less accidents, less liability, less cost, less, less issue. But it also shows you why investing in compute is so important because they're going to have to keep working on this problem for a long time to come. This idea that FSD is sold, and maybe we'll talk about that in a minute, is kind of a silly notion to me because it's it's going to be constantly improved. It has to be constantly improved, particularly when you scale this thing, right? So it's also a lesson to those of us that have FSD. You know, we, we may go a month or more. We will go a month or more where there's no disengagements at some point. 
we still have to be vigilant, right? So I just sort of wanted to provide that. As th this is the March of Nines that Tesla is on, and they'll be on this March for a long time to come. Okay. Hey, and so three, three mm -hmm. things. Um, first of all, uh, CERN, that chart just blew my mind. Like to, to visualize what the March of the Nines means, I'm sure the audience really appreciates. Uh, that's why you guys get paid the big bucks. And I have a quick question. So does the March I'll send you a t-shirt, sir. <laughs> so does, uh, do we need a supervised robo-taxi? Do we start with that? in order to uh, you know, start d down this path of, of additional nines? My answer what? to that is I think that people will be able to verbally instruct the robo-taxi, and that will solve a lot of the problems. And for me, that, that's kind of a key element in this. If you can tell the robo-taxi, reverse, don't, don't turn there, or please go ahead and get in the left lane now, Whatever it is, if people can do that, and if that heads off some of these issues, that that would be great. So I, I don't know if you need, you know, supervised FSD or not. That that remains to be seen for some of the tougher challenges. So does does that imply that we need XAI to uh, to be able to command the uh, robo taxi? Ultimately, you do. Hmm. Or or some model, some language yeah. Model. I, for the for the best experience, I think you need that. Yeah. When, when you, when, so from working in the field of reliability and, and quality, one of the things you have to do with the data is, <clears throat> is understand the environment and the sensitivity, uh, sensitivity analysis of the environment. So if they're, if you're getting to numbers like one in a million, but if you have a million devices out there, um, you have to understand that what, like what, what levels drive various changes in, in consumer behavior and awareness. So we wouldn't want to be at the point where there's some sort of like terrible video every single day. So I think Tesla is going to have to think through some of these things to understand, understand that we would in the industry I was in, like we would under, we would know like what, like, for example, you, you, you really couldn't have an issue over 500 PPM uh, when you're doing a very large high volume <clears throat> launch in a very short period of time, when people are going to all open these devices in a 30 day period, you couldn't have problems over certain thresholds. So it's going to be interesting to understand how, how Tesla works through this in the age of social media and the age of instant video and in the age of everything. Uh, and really understand like, you know, what is the baseline for humans today? Cause the baseline for humans today, I think they can, they can exceed, I believe pretty quickly. And I would just add that in the state of California, Waymo with what they have for now and their self-reporting of their disengagements, last year they were at 99.994% reliability. One disengagement per uh, 17,000 miles. Um, Herbert, can you, can you um, please show Elon's tweet that you showed just before CERN's table? I, I'm just trying to think this through when he said, you know, what they're, how quickly they're going to improve. We have a clear path to doubling average miles between interventions in August. So at the moment, do we know what the yeah. average miles between interventions is? How much is it now? Yeah. So that, that question was asked after this. So this guy, Elias Martinez, f does this FSD community tracker. He gets people to submit how many, uh, when they use FSD, he's been doing it for many, many different versions and 12.5 is the latest. He finally got a thousand miles. So then he had 118 people give covering 1.4 thousand miles. And what he's finding is that in 12.3.6, it was 352 miles with no critical disengagement, but by 12.5, it's 645, almost double, right? So he puts together these tables like this. Uh, it follows it and you can see from 12.3, the yellow is city miles and the blue is over mi overall miles. 12.3 versus 12.5, there was a clear jump. And same thing with the non-critical. Okay. Uh, Could you, would you mind just, and uh, this is great, but should we getting back to that in a second? Could you just go back to CERN's table? You know, the lines were, okay. So, yeah, so, so we are currently we? at one per, per a thousand miles with 12.5, right? Right. I wouldn't, I would not 
recommend taking that data literally. I think what Elon was referring to is, I know where you're going, by the way, it's a great question. I think Elon was referring to um, relative, like relative performance. I don't think he was blessing that data and saying that that's absolute okay. data. I think he's referring to, te- by the way, Tesla has the real dashboard of data of all of our cars. So they know the real number. So I know there's people tweeting like, why, then why wouldn't he like put that out there? He doesn't, nobody, he doesn't have to. So like, yeah, th- so. this is what he actually replied to. He, uh, Alex, Alex Voigt, uh, d- uh, after you saw that one from Elias, he, Alex then replied saying, Tesla just doubled the miles between FSE disengagements from 12.3 to 12.5. They've doubled the miles between the engagement and they're going to double them again and again and again. 645 FSE miles driven between disengagement. It's what an average US, US driver does statistically in 16 days or half a month. So today you can drive half a month safely on FSD and you won't need to disengage a single time. Soon Where does that data come month. from? I guess How he does took, he know what every driver? The 14,000, I think he took yeah. the 14,000 annual miles per car. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then that's where Elon then said, we're gonna double. So not only did we already double from 12.3 to 12.5? Elon's saying it's going to double again from 12.5 this month for, the, for the, this month. So that's so double from 600. Well, let's say the 645 are real. I mean, again, I think this is a little bit shot in the air, but yeah. let's say 645. So that would mean the next iteration, 12.6 or whatever it's going to be, would yeah. then be 1,290. Is, is that what the double means? Double the miles? Yep, double mm-hmm. the miles. Okay. Yeah, and we don't have the the fifty thousand um, cluster up online. We don't have. We're not even exactly. using hardware four to its extent. So there's there's a lot of wood here to to chop. Yeah, exactly. I mean, hardware three, which is the most cars, doesn't have twelve point five yet. So we may have a much mm-hmm. lower. Mileage. Meaning, there's more headroom. There's more headroom for improvement. Like there's there, Tesla's not at the extreme on anything. This isn't like stretching and like there's just they have they have more bandwidth to improve. Yeah. Yeah. I like would, you said, Jeff, you cannot take that table, all that data. It, it's it's flawed. There's a lot of flawed info to there. Exactly. But I, I, I applaud them for trying. Yeah, I yeah, applaud them something. for for trying. It just yeah, not to take it absolutely, but I, I do right. applaud right. people trying to crowdsource. It's showing the direction of it, which is helpful. Sure. Right, but that the data that, that we see there is very few miles at this point. So the, the confidence interval around that right. is very wide right now. So until we get more miles, that confidence interval, you know, when, when, as we get more miles, the confidence interval will shrink. And we can be more clear of exactly where those lines are. Would Among Elon... us, is, is Jeff the only one who has 12.5 at the moment? 12.51. Yes. 12.51, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. I'm stuck with uh, hardware three, unfortunately. So I'm waiting me patiently. Too. Me too. Me yeah. three. Me four. Um, so, so wouldn't Elon correct if he's engaging with a post with data points? Um, can't we deduce that he would tweak it somehow, or if it's far off, he he would correct course correct? No, I don't okay. think so. I think what he was referring to was that Alex said doubling, and he goes, "Oh, it's going to double then." It already doubled, and it'll double again and again. I think that's that's what he was referring to, not the actual table, because this mm-hmm. was the one that he replied to. Okay. Yeah. What do you guys think about uh, this email or this picture that came around, started going around? I don't know if it's true. Do you guys think it's real? This is Elon apparently sending an email to the team. It looks weird. I mean, first of all, it's like red EM. Does that is that the way his email looks? He says, in North America, please make sure that all test drive vehicles are upgraded to 12.5.1 and all test drives as well as new vehicle and service deliveries include a five to 10 minute demonstration of FSD. This is extremely important. Most Tesla owners or prospective owners have no idea how good FSD has become or how to use it. And he said, we're working with regulatory authorities in other countries to roll out supervised FSD worldwide. I mean, if it's a fake, it, it's very probable that it could be a real. So let's just take it for a real. The, the two things that are a bit strange is that it doesn't say to everybody, but ah, in the French way with the accent or maybe Spanish, but I don't know which language it is. So not sure where, where it got cut and, and, and pasted. Um, but the idea is obviously the right one. And uh, you, you probably have followed that Bloomberg interview with that fund manager I've never heard about before, uh, who had 12.3.6, did a test drive, got a, got a car from a, um, 
a Tesla shop and did a test drive and then says he had to intervene for it not to crash. He doesn't have any video footage of it, despite the fact that his son was with him to be on a video. So I don't know whether all that is true. But the thing is that if people test drive a 12.3.6, uh, while they could have the 12.5.1 on the on the car, that's sort of opening the door to issues that you could that you could avoid. So so I, I hope he sent an email like that out and that all the cars are updated when they get when they get shown to the clients or potential clients and that the somebody in the shop takes the time to um, in the sales center takes the time to instruct the client how to use it. Not sure even five to ten minutes is enough time, but anyway, so on and, and then before they let them before they let them lose. The last time mm -hmm. I saw uh, an email like this, it was um, before I was picking up my cyber truck and I wasn't allowed to pick it up from the Tesla showroom. I I was uh, forced to take an FSD ride to some uh, auxiliary lot. So, hmm. uh, and then, and then the whole French thing and the EM looking weird. I mean, it just depends on your client and what country you're in. So I think that uh, everything makes sense here and it, and it smells correct. What's going on with your video? Why did it do what? that? Oh, cause it's like center stage or something. I don't, no, I don't know. It went back and then it went forward. Yeah, I don't know. Oh. There, move there's an easy way to find out if this is true. If somebody okay. who is pick, is watching this and picking up a vehicle in the next few days, just drop a comment and let us know. What? Yeah. No, they're already doing that though. No, but I'm I, don't think, I don't think there's anything new in the email. No, just twelve point five point one. No, I'm I'm saying that if, if you're questioning whether or not this this email is legitimate, if it's real, then we can find out if somebody who's just purchased a vehicle were they subject to this, mm -hmm. right? Now, I, I believe they've already been doing this, right, for the, mm -hmm. the previous versions of FSD. I think so. Herbert is right. It's it's just making sure that the cars have 12.5.1 on them when they yeah. are given out for test drives. And and I think that's the correct thing to do. Because it's that good. That's why he's doing that. It's such a leap forward. Well, that's the one you want to show now, people. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you guys think about this one then? So the other big uh, statement he made is AI5 is 18 months away from high volume production. So right now we're, we're optimizing FSD on hardware four and uh, he, they're retrofitting it to a hardware three, which will be in a couple of weeks, we'll get that. But AI5 is 18 months away. So I was hoping that that was gonna come sooner. He does say high volume production though, right, Jeff? So what does that mean? Yeah, I think most people misread that. So he's talking about the point in time where the production of the AI5 system aligns with the daily output rate of where it's going into, which at that time will be cars and, and bots. So when that's where you, when you try to get the high volume, which means it will be in production the quarter prior um, and, and maybe a month or two even before that, it'll start production. So the key milestones are when you start production and when you get the peak run rate. So he's talking about high volume is when it would get the, the peak run rate 18 months so early part of uh, 2026, but you'll see it in production right. you know, earlier late December, so late next year. Are you guys thinking then that that's when RoboTaxi first vehicle will be uh, coming out? Not necessarily. I don't think it's dependent on that. I uh, guess it is. Well, let's be, well, let's be, let's be clear. You're, we're asking two different questions. Okay. There will be AI5 silicon available to integrate into a small number of things, you know, before 18 months, he said 18 months to be in high volume, high volume. which means before a before 18 months, it will be available to put in the product. Yes, but when will he actually do high scale production of robo taxi? It will be AI five. I doubt that they're going to do hardware four on it. it. No, it will be AI five. It'll be the following following half of the following year, 26. Yeah, there you go. See, <laughs> and the bot too, bot bull. If it's available, in my mind, there's no reason to hold up bot production for AI5, if yeah, that's Harbor the case. Hardware 4 will be the 1,000 to 2,000, and then version 2, which is 2026, which is high-scale production version 2, that's the one that's going to be AI5. So that's yeah, why I sounds, think it's important. Yeah. It sounds, sounds like right, it right? may line up, but I, I don't see it as being a critical thing. Okay. Remember, remember AI5 has to get built 
and then you know either at silicon or module level and then it has to go and be integrated into the full board the full computer it has to be made into a computer and then once it's made into a computer then it needs to be transported to the tesla factory so this is a supply chain within itself so you know just just for people to bear in mind like when ai5 starts it doesn't go into a car the following day jeff what where in the life cycle of an, an, a new a hardware are we uh, in AI5? Is it just prototyping or is it just an idea that they're going to have to, uh, you know, iterate? Uh, what do you, uh, you mean, have they started prototyping AI5? I yeah. think they're, I think they're, they're still in, I think they're still in design. The, the key, the key milestone is, is something called initial tape out. I don't know if they've gone to initial tape out yet. They don't have to have gone to initial tape out at this point. Um, but that's one of the things you kind of, you race towards that, but you want to, you also want to do it with no design errors and you got to, you want to get everything you, you can because those are expensive and they're big milestones. So initial tape out, and then they'll, then they'll do a series of probably minor spins and then they will, uh, do something called uh, release to production. Um, so that's, that's how it will work. But just Elon's comment is going to be very clear. It's high volume production so it will be available you know probably the quarter prior just in lower volumes how does this in your view jeff coincide with what we had in the q2 report where they said we're gonna build these new models not on the unboxed model yet and on, the unbox will only be for for uh, the robo taxi do you feel that this is the same timeline that those first models will still be version four and yeah, it could those drive. first models will be a uh, existing computer, existing manufacturing lines, and then whatever new platform modules are available, they will pull them forward. So I'm thinking, think motors, think maybe a new battery module. Um, you know, the, you know, think about those things. They'll pull those forward uh, into these because they they should have been ready. Just to be clear, they should have been ready anyway. If Robo Taxi is you know, due to converge and the call it the middle part of 2025, the module should have been ready at least six months prior for production. Okay, so we're actually late. What about this thought? At the earliest part of this show, we talked about Samsung partnership with Tesla. Now, I think Tesla makes our own hardware three, hardware four, and now AI five, we make them ourselves. But maybe now that we're heading into this mass production of, you know, millions and millions of robo taxis maybe he's willing to partner with samsung and that's the one partnership what do you think jeff well no they're 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 a fab partner for some parts already and then tsmc is as well um so in terms of who's who's assembling the board the computer i'm i'm not sure uh, who that is or if it's it's not necessarily i would something i would call extremely relevant um, so, but yes, the, the, one of the meetings to meet with Samsung is about scale and it's usually, um, at the fab capacity level. And that would be for AI five, in my opinion. And it would also, uh, be at the high bandwidth memory level. There's a couple of high bandwidth memory suppliers, uh, Micron, uh, SK Hynix and, uh, in Samsung. So they, it would be another reason to meet with them. And then there's other components, obviously, uh, with with the cameras that are in the vehicle, um, I think I think their uh, display suppliers not Samsung at this point. But anyway, we're just I would just be be guessing. But uh, there's other there's other there's other partners for that that would probably do quite well uh, for them because it's not it's not an OLED it's not an OLED screen. So that's what Samsung specializes in. And, and no Tesla phone, right? No Tesla phone. <laughs> no Tesla phone. If I'm the CEO of Samsung, I want that chip deal to make AI5 because it's millions of vehicles and it's billions Absolutely. of bots. Billions yep. of bots. That's that's a game changer right there, the number of bots. Well, they'll be, just to be clear, they should be multi, if not tri-sourced on, on that. But yeah, you want the initial deal and it, it, it is hard to dual source that. So what they would ask Samsung to do is they would ask them most likely 
for their uh, their geographical redundancy plan for them just to make it themselves basically like okay give me fabs in austin give me fabs in south korea you, you know just they would probably they would probably work on that anyway we're getting ahead of ourselves i think they're no, we're not samsung is definitely <laughs> no, strategic samsung is yeah. definitely strategic for them from a supply perspective and i think it's on fab capacity primarily but Jeff, Jeff, if, if, if I'm Tesla and I'm about to tell you I'm going to build millions of bots, I want to get your chips, right, or your, your fab for me, could they not lock up the big fab manufacturers yep. and say, yeah, I've got the supply, I'm going to, you know, multi-year, I've got a gotcha. Now what's going to happen to the other bot companies? How are they going to get their chips if these guys are at least locked up, you know? Part of the reason that you hear Elon consistently talking about the scale of bots are because in the industry, there is nothing of that complexity built at that scale anywhere in the world. Yes. So when you create that platform, so you, you are sending a message to the analyst, investor, Wall Street base, but you're also sending a message to the supply chain. And it's going, I, I think it's going to create one of the biggest frenzies in terms of trying to, to line up a partnership with Tesla of anything in history. I can't think of anything else. If like if you could if you could be first in line to be working on this, it's gonna take a couple of years obviously to get the scale. But if you can if you could win if you're a supplier and you can win an award on something that could be the highest volume thing ever made, you want that. And you will give up something in the interim to get that. You will if you're if you're a if you're a current Tesla supplier, vehicle supplier uh, part supplier to them, you may be giving up something to them now on the three and Y, or you may give up something on the cyber truck. And um, so Tesla is creating the ultimate hedge and um, really frenzy, quite frankly, for the next couple of generations. They've said they, they've, they, today, they make the highest volume car. They said they're going to make a car that's higher volume. And then they, they're, they're going to bring on a bot that's many times that volume so that creates a frenzy you guys have to applaud me look how hard my job is i'm freaking ceo I'm of this thing i have to like pull out the wisdom that's sitting in everybody's heads here i gotta like yes you do though <laughs> did you break a sweat herbert you okay <laughs> i'm just like i'm hot i'm hot <laughs> I'm wearing my t-shirt. Come on, what's wrong with you? I sent an email out. Your special edition t-shirt? Okay. And Alexandra says, no, I'm going to wear my red jacket. Fine, fine, fine. Okay, watch this. I got another brilliant mind. In this case, it happens to be Alexandra again. She's found a way that Tesla stock should actually increase significantly more than what happened when uh, Tesla was included in S&P. This is brilliant. Again, people like you are the only people that can talk about this. It's so So smart. did you just auto-congratulate yourself for this? <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, he just stole checking. Your he did, right? He, he, he did, right? Okay. Just, just yeah. making sure I got it. Um, yes. So I've actually brought this forward in, in April already here, but then probably Herbert didn't listen, um, which is that currently Tesla is in the same bucket on the stock exchange than Amazon and then typical car makers, which is the consumer discretionary. Amazon is the biggest one in there. I actually think Amazon shouldn't be there either. But anyway, so this is the consumer discretionary, very um, linked to consumer spending and um, not the smallest bubble, but obviously not the biggest one. The biggest bubble is the IT bubble. So this uh, visualized chart is the whole sector. So they take the market cap. What is more important for me is actually the ETFs in each sector, how much they are invested. So they're about um, 30, they're about eight times more money invested in ETFs for the tech sector than for the consumer discretionary, because typically just people like to buy tech ETFs. And um, who is deciding which stock goes where? Well, this is a committee between two companies, the S&P company, which we obviously all know from the ratings, and MSCI, which also does some ratings, but is usually more know known for their indices. They have a group together and they do these um, sector 
classifications. They change once per year. They make changes. Usually they announce it late summer for the next year in March so that people have a long run up time to understand that this company is now changing of sector. I don't think they understand today that Tesla is anything else than a car maker, haha. But at one point they will. So what do they base their judgment on whether a certain company should be in one bucket rather than the other? It's both revenues, sales, and profits. And so that's probably the issue why Amazon is still in consumer discretionary because obviously their sales volume is still mainly in um, in um, consumer goods, not their profitability, as we all know. So probably they're waiting for the to, to shift that both are there. But I mean, with Amazon, that's going to be difficult because just of the high volume they have in in selling consumer goods. But with Tesla, it's going to come sooner than later. And CERN is the right person to to ask this question. So when will the traditional auto sector have? less than 50% of Tesla's revenues and less than 50% of Tesla's profits. That moment will come. I think it's going to be 2026, but we'll hear, hear CERN on that because I think that's the moment it will turn and they will finally attribute Tesla to the tech segment. And then every tech ETF that's indexed has to change. And most of them are indexed on exactly this, this uh, GICS uh, categorization and they will have to change and go you know and 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 increase the stack that or even build it up um and and use tesla in their in their uh, tech uh, etfs and so i do believe actually believe that's going to be more consequential than the s p inclusion of 2020 because that segment is eight times bigger for etfs than the consumer discretionary segment and uh, all, I mean, while there will be consumer disc uh, discretionary ETFs that will have to sell Tesla because now it won't be in there anymore, all the tax have to purchase it. And in and the higher the stock price will be then, more they have to purchase because it will be higher weighted wow. in there. So it's, it's actually completely contradictory to what they should do. They should do it as early as possible because if they do it in two years and the stock price is already much higher, it's going to be even more difficult for them to purchase all that. So I, I see this coming. The question obviously is, when will we have both revenue and profit that is not linked to pure car production and sales. We have to also see how they will how they will treat the energy segment because the energy segment today is already in percentage points more profitable than the car sales. Um, but it's going to shift and it's going to shift sooner than later. Sir, and I want to hear you on all this. Well, I have a few thoughts on this. One is this whole S&P sector thing is kind of silly. I mean, look at Amazon, look at Google, look at Microsoft. There are so many different businesses, you know, is Amazon tech, is Amazon consumer, is Amazon this or that financial. I mean, the sector classification, you're trying to force, you know, these companies into, into these nice, neat buckets, and it's kind of silly. The other thing I wonder is even if Tesla meets the qualifications to be put into tech, you still have to deal with the S&P changing their thought process. And Alexander, you are, you've addressed this firsthand with the S&P committee on the debt side, right? They're pretty slow moving dinosaurs on these things. So I don't hold out much hope that the S&P does it when, they're, when they should. I don't hold out much hope that they do what is correct or is right, or however, however you want to look at that. And in the end, I don't think it matters because to your last point that if Tesla does as well as we think it will long term, then all the money will be chasing after Tesla, wh whatever bucket it's put in. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting in the short term. Definitely, if Tesla was put in the tech sector today, yes, it would attract more investment because of the capital that's invested in, in tech versus other sectors. But longer term i don't think it matters so with that said um i, I imagine our audience is thinking "Ooh, i should buy th that that understands options uh, i should buy 2026 leaps uh herbert can we take a second and maybe talk about like recession risk and macroeconomics right, uh, currently happening uh, mm -hmm. i'd love to hear what you guys think uh, about it 
uh, before everyone goes and buys leaps tomorrow. I thought you were going to tell us all about it. No, no, I'm the guy that asked the questions, not, not, not. Wait, and I'm answer. the guy that asked the questions. That's good. <laughs> Sometimes. Come on, Jeff. Well, I'll, tell me I'll your microphone. First. Or CERN, please. I'll be the first to say that I don't know, right? I mean, when, when will robotaxi revenue spool up to the point that it's meaningful and matters? We don't know. We don't know. We, we, we can see directionally that it's coming. It's hard for anybody to make those specific projections. And then bots, you know, we've shown the numbers that it doesn't take many bots for Tesla to, to print some massive profit numbers in the bot business. But when will that start happening? Well, they're going to start selling externally sometime in 2026, we think. Right. And then layer on other external things like what's going on with the economy or, you know, another pandemic, you know, knock on wood, we don't have one of those again for a long time. Right, so all these unknown factors. So, you know, it, it's so difficult to know. Um, the ideal thing is to have a super long time horizon and then none of this stuff matters. Exactly, and I mean, options is maximum two years. And I can tell you the only money I've ever lost on Tesla was with options, be it leaps or be, uh, and that's, I mean, it's just one of the things I've learned I'm not touching anymore. I know lots of people make a lot of money with options, but I just don't. So, and I think the one thing that is clear with Tesla that's complicated is timing, both timing of execution and then as certain said, timing of S&P and MSCI, whatever. Um, what I'm trying to do with that sector change, because I honestly think it does matter, because there is so much passive investment in the United States. Most of the 401k money is in index funds. And uh, people are just have very small latitude of telling their fund managers what to do. So it's mostly a choice of different index funds. And so the, the money is stuck there. And if they have to suddenly include Tesla, which they do not at the moment, it will bring a, a, a huge purchasing force with it. But again, do I know when that will happen? I mean, we'll sh try to shame them into it, but for sure, you know, we have to raise awareness and I'm raising awareness much too early. We're, we're two years, at least two years ahead of it and could be five years ahead of it. So with options, you only have a two year horizon. Um, you know, I, I still think the, the 2026 leaps are very cheap. But that's because I'm so overly enthusiastic about about Elon and about and about Tesla. And again, I have lost money on Leap, so I don't want to really repeat um, that experience again. It was it was hurtful enough. I, just on macro, um, you know, the ten year yield dip below four percent today. Uh, the bond market is is telling you that it is concerned. You're seeing, you know, you're seeing increased volatility in equity markets. We had a summer of very low volatility. Now you've seen this increased volatility and the markets are telling you that <clears throat> they're not sure that we're going to uh, escape uh, some sort of some form of a recession. So uh, my opinion, I think the Fed should have cut in July. I think they should have signaled more than a month ago that they were going to cut in July or that it was on the table and then they should have executed. And so right now the markets are concerned that the Fed is going to do what it's always done, which is be late. Uh, there's a dual mandate around um, low inflation. We have core, core inflation now approaching 2.5%. The Fed has always said that they would, they would start cutting well before it gets to the 2% goal. And then you have... Um, jobs, employment, and you've you've already had this move off the low of uh, three point six percent unemployment to four one. You know, if tomorrow if we get a four two or four three, you know, it's going to make today look like uh, you know child's play in terms of the action that was happening today. So, uh, hopefully, we get a, a favorable now. Now, good news is actually good news for the market, uh, whereas before you you wanted. Uh, somewhat bad news so that the Fed would be more in line with cutting. And now it looks like it's more of a foregone conclusion for September. It was a very bizarre Fed meeting. It was like he opens page one of his binder and he wants to tell you every, every reason why he's going to cut in September. Well, why didn't we just do it here? Uh, even if it's, you know, 25 or 50 basis points, it would have been, um, it would have been a good move. So the market's worried the Fed's going to be late. And if you see a bad jobs number tomorrow, look out. 
We'll see, not financial advice, uh, but you've got labor market deteriorating. You've got, if you go from basically the the SOM rule, uh, I think it was invented by uh, economist Claudia SOM regarding if you see a half percent move upward in unemployment in a given cycle. So we've been down to three, six, and now we're up at four, one, goes to four, two, four, three. That is a, you know, 100% indicator uh, or a very high percentage indicator of an inflation coming, uh, or sorry, of, of a recession coming, excuse me, excuse me there. So that's what I see going on with macro. I think people are concerned. We've had a mixed bag in earnings, uh, but big tech, I think, has largely uh, come through. Um, so, so we'll see, we've got more earnings. We've got more earnings to go. We've got the big one at the end of August with NVIDIA. And, and by the way, every hyperscaler, you know, people that are building these data centers are coming on these earnings call and saying the AI trade, the, the, sorry, the AI investment is still on. In fact, it's going to get bigger. So that that's kind of my comments on macro and, and what are some of the big drivers of, of, of macro currently the markets are, are, are definitely concerned by the action you're seeing in increased volatility uh, in it showing. Thank you guys. Uh, yeah. August is historically a, uh, uh, a troublesome month, especially in an election year. So uh, that's something to consider. Uh, and, you know, yesterday, I, I think it was yesterday I posted that I'm putting a line here at uh, 234. Uh, because of uh, a previous gap that was left between like 231 and 234. And then, uh, and I was concerned. So today we actually closed the gap that was also left on the way up between, uh, I think it was like 213 and 218, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. So, you know, th- those technicals are, are, are good. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's nice to see it pull back and play out the way that we, we see historically. Um, there's an anecdotal uh, story that I can tell you about uh, my business, uh, which is the frozen yogurt business. Uh, I, I, we've, we've seen an increase uh, across uh, the industry uh, in sales, and it's, uh, it's significant. It's over 25%, um, and, and, and it's, my understanding is it's nationwide. So I, I spoke with my business partner uh, and trying to understand precisely why this is happening. And uh, since he's the founder, he, he in 2007 is when uh, our uh, brand was incepted. And that was recession uh, times. And uh, this is a recession business. So I'm trying to draw a conclusion whether that is why we're seeing it. You're not going to go to the movies. Uh, Powell yesterday spoke regarding uh, that we are seeing consumer spending slow, but the economy is still strong. So that was my derivation was that we were seeing basically you're still going to go spend money uh, and have a treat with your family. Uh, it's not a super expensive thing to do, uh, unlike some of the other things like, uh, you know, Universal Studios or something, I, you know, not to call out, out anyone or Disneyland or, or whatever. So I, I would be looking at that uh, and I will look at that. Uh, and I just had that light bulb moment uh, yesterday morning. So, uh, yesterday afternoon and didn't, didn't follow up on it. Uh, so I just wanted to share that. Um, and then, yeah, I think Powell stated that, uh, he was asked specifically, uh, the, the Psalm rule, I think it is. And, and I need to do some more research on that. So Jeff, wonderful job, uh, breaking, breaking down. I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing here. I would just yeah. add to that parts of the economy have already been in recession whether it's housing, whether it's autos, other parts of the economy, it's not like the whole economy goes into recession at the same time. There's parts of it that kind of roll into it and roll out. So, you know, just because the, you know, a recession might be officially called, doesn't mean that other parts of the economy aren't recovering and doing really well. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. So let's, uh, I want to show some graphs that uh, CERN came and uh, shared with us here and says here, Tesla's competition has paid for Tesla's entire computer spend. Can you tell us what this is? Yeah, this is kind of in my ongoing series on looking at the regulatory credits in different ways. 
So initially, I looked at regulatory credits as paying for a portion of Tesla's CapEx, about 27% of Tesla's CapEx since 2018. This is looking at it in a different way and saying, okay, Tesla, throughout its entire history, since it's been in existence, has spent about $5 billion on compute. And I'm defining compute here as both their spending on computer equipment, hardware and software, 2.6 billion, and AI infrastructure spend of 2.5 billion so far. So they've spent 5.1 billion on compute. In the last three years, just the last three years, the regulatory credits have, Tesla's earned 5.5 billion in regulatory credits. So what I find kind of amusing about this is that Tesla's competition has funded Tesla's <laughs> higher compute spend yeah. to build software to make vehicles autonomous that will put them out of business. Forcing and more, them, right? And more because, them, I mean, yeah. Sorry, I was just, just, just to finish the thought, forcing those same competitors to come to the table and license the software, the FSD software that they've paid for. <laughs> yeah. And the and the total the total um, Zeph revenues we have is nine billion, right? Eight point eight. Eight point eight, yeah. And we yes. know there is at least another four point nine already coming because they're already promised. So this is just absolutely crazy. Yeah, and interestingly, this quarter Ford disclosed that they uh, have committed to three point eight billion in regulatory credit spend in Europe and North America. So there's a high likelihood that a good chunk of that 4.9 billion came from Ford. So Ford should have negotiated a deal where they said, hey, we'll pay you 3.8 billion in regulatory revenue, and we want a sweet deal when we license FSD. Because they're, they're contributing a big chunk of money to pay for it. There's yeah, a forcing I mean function. Sorry, Alvin. Yeah, Claire, clearly there is and i mean how many times did we hear from tesla q yeah these are one offs you can't take them into account i mean at 13 billion now um that's not one off that's a lot of money uh, i mean the typical gigafactory is what 4 billion 3 to 4 billion i believe so, so. Yeah. this is crazy 13 billion well the smart and, and analysts look at the work that cern done and they look like they, and you can for you can see what the capex direction of these companies and where they're going, and you can see that they're going to have to buy these regulatory credits. And so, for every analyst that comes out and, and looks at a Tesla earnings report and scoffs, I think one of the things you need to realize is Tesla has figured out the recipe in terms of how they develop product, how they build it, and acquiring scale so they can actually make this work and build EVs in volume. Others have not figured it out. So it is creating a forcing function where they have to go buy credits because they can't do the other thing, which is make more EVs. The more EVs they make currently, the more money that they actually lose. It's not, it's not just a case of adding more scale. They, don't, they didn't have the unit economics recipe right to build one unit properly. So I hope... I, I, it, to me, it's just a different lens that's needed it, it, for it's kind of like being embarrassed of like regulatory credits or oh, these are, you know, it's hor we're doing this, but whatever. No, you've, you've actually achieved something in terms of being able to make this product that others have not been able to do. And make it profitably. Yeah. Profitably. The competition is coming with buckets of cash for Tesla <laughs> to build it. batteries and software to compete against those same companies. I and to then buy themselves. it from them. Yeah. All right. We just have a few more minutes. So I'm going to end it with uh, Elon Musk talking about RoboTaxi. So please, Alexandra, Jeff, Xander, listen very closely to what he says. Sounds very much like what I've been saying the last few days. Oh, Here we go. Next, how does the future of transportation impact that? Well, you know, if, if you're not driving, the, you're really effectively sitting in like a tiny lounge. Um, and then, so, you know, having, say, ha, you know, being entertained with, with being able to watch movies or, or play video games or work, um, 
you can, it's really the car just becomes like a tiny mobile lounge. Um, that's that's what, or you could sleep, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, I mean, you could drink too. I mean, you're not driving, right? so. <laughs> um, so it's this thing where, like, it's like a little mobile lounge. It's it's not something that you have to be. Um, we have to be, you know, focus your attention on driving all the time. So it's just a it's a completely different experience. I'm so pleased you played that again because he didn't just say mobile lounge, he said tiny mobile lounge. And so you with your strange idea of a London cap size, that's not a tiny lounge. That's a okay. right. completely inefficient size of a car. We'll take a so look. Um, yeah. I think we're back to my two-seater and you we'll can see. acknowledge I, I looked that you up lost the this definition well. of a lounge and the definition of a lounge tiny is a lounge? room. Is a, <laughs> is a tiny, room. tiny lounge. Tiny lounge. <laughs> okay. okay. So we're still, uh, still neither so of us what, are convinced. Hang, hanging in there. Can you? What's the bet for those that aren't following? The we're we're all going to there's Hawaii. We're I know Herbert Hawaii. keeps like Herbert keeps making friends, it up. Friends, family, <laughs> friends, family. He pays everything. Don't oh, you worry. Okay. No, no, no. I mean, are we are we saying that the because he said if you aren't driving, that implies that you're, you know, that's robo taxi. But is that the first iteration? Is the bet right. that you guys are saying that the first yeah. iteration means yeah, yeah. you're going to we, sleep in yeah. the back? And drink? That, that's already why he's wrong. That's what Her time. Herbert pretends. That's obviously completely wrong. He no, spoke no, about no. the future of transportation. He didn't listen to that part either. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, just uh, we've covered it many times, but I'm just saying that the very first iteration of the very first robo taxi designed vehicle is not going to be this two seater, very cramped uh, kind of thing. It's going to be more like a London cab, which means have you seen London cab? It's a little bit more of a squarish thing. You have a little bit more room. You might be able to fit four people if you want to. It's much more roomy. That's what I'm just saying. The so. queen disagrees. <laughs> she does. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Having That's fun. That's a good look. That's a good look. <laughs> we'll get you a proper crown and uh cern thank you very much for <laughs> joining I don't us need a crown. <laughs> yeah you do thank you, you do. herbert you thank you for being good sport when we dash it out and, and before we before we go uh since we beat you up so much herbert i gotta say the way that you're prepared with the slides and in the beginning of the show i was just marveled how you could just go you you have it ready to go no matter where the conversation goes so good yeah job. it's ceo like <laughs> Rest short like everything's perfect. I, I appreciate that, this. The is, this short. is that CEO like, okay? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Jeff. I was Look yelling for it. HR at that point. Yes, he was. Yeah. I took that we're picture. Still, you should see we're the still video. searching for HR. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Xander. And of course, thank you, CERN. You always come with fantastic tables and uh, analysis, and we appreciate that. It's a good thing. Thanks, have, you, it's a good thing I'm the one that can pull off the... I'm just kidding. I'm not going to take your <laughs> credit. See you guys. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.